Grace, mercy, and peace, brothers and sisters, are yours, not by any work that you have performed, but by the gift of God that is faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And the word of God that we consider is that gospel lesson. We'll just settle into it with these words of Jesus. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. As of the year 2023, there were almost one and a half million accountants and auditors working in America, which was up about 40,000 from the year before. Companies like Google literally employ hundreds of accountants. That is an awful lot of bean counters, which means one thing. There's a lot of beans to count. And I started thinking, I wonder if they actually have trouble not taking their work home. I mean, does an accountant, every time they open the pantry, take an inventory of how many numbers of cream of mushroom soup there are? Every time you, you use a shower, do you, are you fully aware of how many extra bars of soap are there? I have no idea. I would imagine if I was an accountant constantly counting beans, I would be constantly counting beans even when I wasn't functioning on a, as an accountant. But what do I know? I'm not an accountant. But that doesn't mean that I don't find myself counting beans. And I think you probably do too. The Pharisees in Jesus' day in this story were sent north into Galilee from Jerusalem, kind of a bean-counting group. They were sent from Jerusalem to the northern region to do an audit on what they had heard about Jesus. No doubt Jesus had spent some time, they had heard his teachings, but rumblings had now drifted down south to Jerusalem about the miracles he was performing in Galilee, the swell of the crowd sizes that were there. And just to be on the safe side, go do an audit. And that's exactly what they do. They sit down and they observe Jesus and his disciples and what is going on there. And they're counting beans and they realize that there are some beans that shouldn't be there that they're starting to count. You see, Jesus didn't mandate and require that his disciples would wash their hands before they eat. You hear it. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? See, the audit book said that you should be finding in rabbinical schools, even this Galilean Jesus rabbi school, you should find hands being washed. Washing is certainly a major part of it. And, you know, in God's Old Testament law, there was room for washing, particularly as it pertained to the priests, as they functioned and carried out their duties day by day, say on the Day of Atonement, standing before the people offering sacrifices uh, to the Lord on account of the people's sins, it was required that they would do a great deal of washing and clean themselves up, so to speak. Well, the problem is, is that the Pharisees had developed outside the perimeter of God's law a whole nother code of laws, and the intention might even seem good on its surface. If God is interested in cleanliness and washing is good for the priests, let's be on the safe side and let's just do an overabundance of washing and keep ourselves clean. After all, when you go to the marketplace, when you go to the grocery store, you never know who you bump into, who you shake hands with. In fact, as you're looking at that apple, and you don't know who's touched that before you. And those hands might have been dirty. And by touching that same apple, you too might be dirty. Therefore, let's just put the law down that just in case we've come into something a little di dirty or unclean, that we just wash ourselves up and we'll require that. The thinking was that if God requires this 
degree of cleanliness. Let's err on the safe side, draw a whole perimeter around it, and if we obey the rules we come up with, we'll never be in danger of disobeying God's law. Well, there's a problem there. And Jesus points it out directly. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. The bean counting that was being done, sin and not sin, righteousness and unrighteousness, was being reckoned according to the auditing code that human beings had fully developed. It was about the traditions that were passed down and handed down. And as those developed, it was farther and farther removed from the realities of what God's law was always there for. Sin could be found everywhere, but it wasn't sin as God defined it. It was defined by the auditors who used the force of this human law and this human tradition to weigh down on people, to hammer them, to beat them up over their sin and their lack of righteousness, at least according to the way that these auditors saw things. Can you imagine... If I, as your pastor, asked if I could put up cameras in your house just to monitor the hand-washing situation. You know, when a kid comes in after three hours of playing blacktop basketball with 20 different neighbors and is thirsty and just wants to reach in the fridge and grab a chocolate milk or grab a glass and get some water, maybe an apple or, or a piece of string cheese, you know how tempting it is for kids to forget to wash their hands. I could even make a pretty good argument about it. If you go back through the scriptures, you can go back early and you see the flood and what was that? It was kind of God washing and cleaning the world up a bit, right? He set up his ceremonial law, certainly, and washing was a part of what the priestly uh, duty was. In fact, even in the New Testament, one of the major, major components and the ways that God works in our life is through baptism, the Greek word for washing. We have forever had the saying that you all know full well there's only one thing that is next to godliness, right? It's cleanliness. So maybe as a pastor it would be a really good idea for me to help you make sure your kids are washing their hands because they don't want to accidentally ingest something dirty. I mean, that's more than gross. That gets into the system, and that's unclean. And we know one thing, cleanliness, that's important to our God. Can you imagine? That's what the Pharisees were doing. They were finding the beans of sin everywhere around them. They were even finding it in the rabbinical school of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus, for his part, he's a teacher, a true rabbi. You see, the Pharisees were missing what God actually intended with the giving of the law. The law was never given by God to his people as a means to produce some kind of righteousness among them. Listen as Jesus describes where they were completely whiffing on the point. Jesus said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes from out of a person that defiles them. All of the focus of the auditors of the Pharisees 
were on the external things that they saw. They were on the external products that they saw people producing. And whatever was happening outside according to what could be seen was defined as righteous or unrighteous. The beans over here, the beans over there. And they whiffed on the whole point of the law. God never gave law to define righteous and unrighteous deeds. It's deeper than that. Jesus said the law was given so that you might understand one thing. It's not about the beans you see. It's about the one being that is within. Corrupt and vile all the way from its beginning. It is out of your heart that you're finding these things. And no law, not even a God-given law, can produce amongst those whose heart is so corrupt one single righteous thing. The Pharisees had completely missed the point. A point that Jesus hammers down again at the end of the text. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. A person cannot keep themselves clean. There is no amount of work that can be done so that a person can be this much righteous before God, not with the heart that lies here. What a lesson that is. And yet the law is good, right? Paul says that in his letter to Timothy. He says, we know that the law is good if, if one uses it properly. The Pharisees didn't know how to use it. To them, law was something to be built upon, ever more stacks of law trying in this human way to produce righteousness, and they whiffed on God's loving intent. That in the law we understand this is a problem. A serious problem before our God. God gave us his law for this reason. So that we can stand as sinners corrupt through and through and stand in awe and praise of the one who came from heaven and lived according to God's law perfectly. An actual righteousness before God produced and given to you. Who know, not more, who know more than just law, but know the gospel, the good news that in Christ righteousness has been produced and given to us. That the beans of our sin have been cleared from the table and a whole new pile of Jesus' beans of righteousness are ours to claim. All of it, again, not because of something we've done, but because of God's further gift to us. The gift of faith that he has given to us as he has washed us, as he has given to us his spirit, as he has given to us a brand new being of a heart, a being filled with the spirit of God and the fruits of faith along with it. Fruits that Paul speaks about, of faith, of hope, of love, of gentleness and endurance, of kindness and patience. All of those things that Paul says, there's no law against. It is God who produces righteousness. He produces it in Christ. He's given it to us through faith so that we might even find it in each other. Isn't it weird? Can't you find yourself and don't you find yourself in your life so often like the Pharisees? Counting beans in other people's lives. 
You see the little unrighteous things, and you see the little righteous things. In the children, you see the same things, and probably you see, depending on whether it's your own children or others' children, whether they're righteous or unrighteous deeds, right? And yet God has taught us the most valuable lesson of first importance. A true righteousness is a righteousness that he must bring because we can't accomplish it. May the one who has fulfilled law and brought it to its end, our Lord Jesus Christ, continue to bless us so that the righteousness he has procured for us and given to us remains in us until we actually become righteous forever in heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God that far transcends all human understanding